Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 10.30. Uh, and at the 10.30 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.
Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 10.30. Uh, and at the 10.30 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. Uh, I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.
Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. Uh, I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. Uh, I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. Uh, I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.
Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 10.30. Uh, and at the 10.30 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Hello and welcome. My name is Pastor Sam. I'm the lead pastor here. And I wanted to extend an invitation to you to please come and visit us anytime you'd like. We have a wonderful, inviting group of people that would love to meet you. Come as you are. No need to get dressed up. No need to change anything about you. We would just love to meet you. We worship at 9 o'clock and 1030. Uh, and at the 1030 hour is when we have our children's ministry programming for all ages. Children, of course, are welcome at both services, in the sanctuary or in the children's ministry. But if you have a family, the 1030 service may be a better time to visit than the 9 o'clock. And I really just wanted to say you are welcome here. You are invited here. We would love to meet you and get to know you. We are a passionate group of people, passionate about the Word of God, about worshiping God, about living life together. We want to engage with one another and our community around us. And so if that's something you're interested in and you would love to know more about who we are, please come, make a visit. I'd love to meet you, love to get to know you, and uh, see if this is a place where we can walk through life together. Thanks so much for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon. Well, hello, people. Welcome to Grace this morning. So glad you guys are with us. And hi to the people that are watching us online as well. Um, welcome to worship. And even those out in the breezeway, church is starting. Come on in. But hey, um, I have a couple of announcements to make. One of them is kind of important um, right up front. There was uh, originally an engaging conversations evening planned for tomorrow night. We are postponing that until the 29th of April. So if you are planning to come tomorrow, just readjust that by a couple of weeks on your calendar and plan to join us instead on Monday, the 29th of April. And for those of you who are new here, maybe you don't know that we do these things every once in a while, about every two weeks, we have a, a, an, a, 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 a <laughs> we have a topic <laughs> that might be a little bit like um, controversial sometimes in our communities. And as a church, we want to kind of come together and be able to have hard conversations about these things. So the topic for the 29th is on war, peace, and the Ukraine. We actually have one of the members of our church is going to present some information in that engaging conversation. And so um, it'll be um, 
enlightening. It's always a great discussion. We have kind of presentation, but there's an opportunity for some back and forth discussion as well. So we hope that you'll join us. We um, meet at 6.30 p.m. on, like I say, about every other Monday, the next one being on the 29th. So don't come tomorrow for that one. Instead, it will be on the 29th. Um, and if you look in your, in your um, uh, bulletins, it's wrong in the bulletin. So now you have been corrected. Please scratch it out in your bulletin. Okay. Um, also coming up in less than a week's time is our women's retreat. Um, guys, this is, uh, uh, ladies, this is a retreat that's in town. It starts on Friday evening, the 19th, and it goes Friday night and then into Saturday all day, basically, from 9 a.m. till 8 p.m., I think, on Saturday. So get ready for some uh, just enjoyable time together to fellowship, to have some meals together, to worship together, and to learn some things, too, about our journey of faith. Um, ladies, if you haven't signed up yet, there's a table in the breezeway. You can do that. If you um, need any help with that, they've got um, some people out there to answer questions. Um, there is a cost for the retreat, but there are also scholarships available. So if that's of any issue to you whatsoever, don't let that get in your way. Um, really, the thing is to come and enjoy yourself with the ladies. So um, take a look at the information online if you'd like to do that, but especially in the breezeway today so you can sign up and not miss out. Okay, we also have a heartbeat class coming up. It's on the 21st Sunday um, afternoon. We'll feed you a light lunch for that class, and this is... The, the class to um, take if you're interested in partnering with us here at Grace as a new member. It's a place where Pastor Sam will teach all about who we are and what we do here at Grace Community Covenant Church. Um, so uh, if, you, if you've taken Heartbeat before, you know that there's another step that you need to take, right? Or a couple of steps to becoming a member. Um, let me know if you need help with that at all. Uh, the very next thing to do is to schedule a time with Pastor Sam and kind of talk about your story and your faith journey a little bit with him. So if you need any help with that, let me know. Um, you guys, most of you know I'm Sue here, but if you don't know me, that's who I am. Uh, track me down and I'll be happy to, to get you um, going with your next steps on that. Okay, you can sign up for Heartbeat in the Breezeway. You can sign up online as well. Today, in a couple of hours... Um, at 2 p.m., we are having our picnic. So I hope you guys signed up for that. We are so excited. We're going to have so much fun at Riverfront Park, 2 p.m. till 5 p.m. Um, go home, put shorts on, or I guess if you already have shorts on, you're ready to go. Um, the <laughs> The, it's probably going to be warm is the point. But anyway, we'll have some games there. We'll have some fried chicken there. Uh, drinks are provided. You are to bring either a side or, uh, or a um, dessert, right? Not a salad, a, a dessert. And I think last week when we talked about this, we all agreed you all are bringing dessert, right? <laughs> so we'll have our, our uh, <laughs> sugar fix this afternoon. Anyway, picnic in the park. We can't wait to see you there. If you need directions for that, take a look um, in, your, in your bulletin. There's a little QR code you can scan, or you can find that, too, um, at mygrace.church, our website here. Thank you guys for putting up with me breathless here, talking about all this stuff. Um, I just want to say thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity here at Grace. If you'd like to give financially, there's a box in the back of the church you can do that. You can also give online if you need any help with any of that. Let me know. If you are new here, just church, you know, checking out our church, please do not feel any obligation whatsoever to give. We are just delighted that you're here worshiping with us today. Um, and I also want to mention, in the spirit of generosity, we can give in many ways. And there's another way you can give, and that is to help us with gardening here at Grace. Now, I was told at first service that when I mentioned, hey, come pull some weeds, that that maybe wasn't the right thing to say. Yeah, right? <laughs> But anyway, this is uh, the idea is here that we are um, after doing some projects to improve the exterior appearance of our grounds. So um, it should be fun to do that stuff. Ray Varco in the back is the guy leading this charge. Yay for Ray. He's already been doing a lot of it, so he probably got the weeds all pulled already. But um, if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet in the breezeway. Uh, any questions about it, grab Ray um, at the end of the service today. With that, I just want to say happy worship to you all. See you at the picnic. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, Grace. Let's stand together, and I will lead us through our call to worship as you respond. This um, call to worship this morning comes from Revelation 15. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O God of the nations. 
Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. here at Grace Church. I am not Sam Jerfe. My name is Charlie LaHardy, and I'm going to be leading us in worship today. Sam and his family have gone off to uh, Colorado or were there last week to, uh, so he could officiate at the wedding of a family friend, and they'll be back again this week. So please meet each other, greet each other, take two minutes, no more, and then get back to your seats. It was a long one. It was. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think it
All right, Grace, let's continue in worship. I got it. I'll do it. <laughs> or I can read it, Charlie. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp, some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent.
pray together. Gracious God, we sing these words of praise to you. And as we praise you, God, we are so reminded that we fail to cling to these words and to own these words as our own. God, that you are our hiding place, that you deliver us when we are afraid. God, our histories know that. Our hearts know that. But in the minute, we often fail to trust you. And in our weakness, Lord Jesus, would you make us strong by the strength and power that you carry us through and you hold each one of us. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you gather together a community of people people who have been here since the foundations of the church and people who walked in for the first time this morning. God, we thank you that our church um, is a place where people come to praise you and worship you. And we thank you for your spirit that leads us and guides us in our day-to-day -day walk with you. God, may we find peace and energy in this place. May we be challenged by your word and by your presence. And in that challenging, Lord Jesus, would you move through us and challenge each one of us to be more bold, to be a light in a dark world. God, you call us to be a friend to the friendless, to be your salt and light in a broken world. Help us to raise to that place. Father God, take our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh. hearts that are moldable to, to what you would call us to do and be. Help us to have confidence in that. Father God, help us to have the courage to reach beyond the walls of this church, into your community, into your cities, and around the world, to be your people. God, we pray for Charlie this morning as he brings your word. Would you give him that very same boldness to preach truth, and give us ears to hear, and hearts that long to be your people, opening our arms wide to those around us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you, worship team. Great music this morning. All right, we're going to start off this morning with a little game. If you're old enough, you might remember a game show on the TV and on the radio earlier than that called Name That Tune. And so this morning, we're going to play Name That Tune briefly. Now, members of the worship team are ineligible, as are employees of the government of Indiana. <laughs> Other than that, you can all play this. All right, let's name this tune. Roy's got it. You've got a friend in me. Thank you, Roy. The only one here that we're all too old, I guess, right? <laughs> That's from the movie Toy Story. It's the theme from the movie Toy Story, an animated movie about a young boy named Andy and his very favorite toy, Woody, the Wild West Sheriff. And the proof of Andy's love for Woody is right there. Andy writes his name on the bottom of Woody's boot to show that he is his best imaginary friend. So today we're going to talk about friendship, real friendship, and in particular, what Jesus had to say about being friends together, friends with each other, and friends with God. We use the word friend to mean a lot of different things. If you're a lawyer, if you file an amicus brief, you're called a friend of the court. If you're a friend of Bill W., that means that you're part of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, a friend of the arts could be someone who supports a local ballet company or a local music festival. Facebook friend, you know what that is, people who can share our Facebook posts, whose posts we can read and, and they can read ours. So we label people in a lot of different ways, though, in our lives, don't we? We call some of them family, like brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. If you work, you have colleagues, you have employees, you have bosses, you might have clients or customers. You have neighbors. If you play a sport, you have teammates. If you're in school, you have classmates and teachers, professors. 
And hopefully, you also have some people that you think of as friends. So let me ask you this, and this is an audience participation question. How do you define a friend? What is it about a person that makes you think of them as a friend? What do you think? They're kind. Okay, good. David, thank you. They put up with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. What else? Respect. Respect. Okay. Yes, Ray? Okay. Good. Mutual faith and concern. Yes. Someone to stand by you no matter what. Yes. Good. Make an effort to understand you. Good, good, good. Okay. So in the scripture Juanita read, or actually Juanita didn't read it. She tried to read it. <laughs> in the scripture that um, Jeanette read this morning, it says that Moses spoke to God face to face as one speaks to a friend, which is pretty remarkable. You can imagine that scene. Moses goes into the tent. The cloud of God comes down over the tent. God and Moses have a conversation. Also in the book of Isaiah, it says that God calls Abraham his friend. Did you know that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are also God's friend? You're a friend of Jesus and a friend of God. We just celebrated Easter, and today's scripture comes from that same night of the disciples gathering in the room together, Jesus teaching them various things, and then going out, and Jesus was arrested, and so on and so forth. Um, they were having their last meal together, and it started out early on after his teaching with him washing the feet of his disciples. And they objected. First of all, he, interestingly, he washes Judas's feet at that same moment, and Judas is later going to be the one to betray him. But they object, and Peter especially says, you can't wash our feet. You are our master. We are your servants. We have to do this. And Jesus responded that, we should be humble, that they should be humble, they should be serving, they should be willing to be servants of each other, and that that means loving each other and even washing each other's feet. And so he was giving them an example of how he wanted them to treat each other. Judas leaves the room and then goes off to uh, arrange for Jesus' arrest. Judas, Judas apparently didn't quite understand what Jesus was getting at. And when he was gone... This is what Jesus said. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, Jesus, you must love one another. As I've served you, serve one another. As I've respected you, respect one another. As I have given to you, led you, laid down my life for you, do that for one another. And he says, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So how do people know that we're Christians? Well, they know it through, at least one way, the love we have for each other in the church. The writer Francis Schaeffer called this the mark of the Christian, our love for each other. It's as if we have a tattoo, maybe of a big heart, that says love one another. This tattoo is the mark that shows that we are God's people, that we are followers of Jesus. And why? Well, because as we know in the world, genuine love is pretty rare, isn't it? Love between people is complicated, and there's a lot of conflict among groups that associate with each other. But if we love one another, we stand out, and that's what makes us, identifies us with Jesus. And also, if we love one another, the love we have for each other is the glue that produces unity among us. And Jesus talked about unity a lot. Toward the end of the same night, Jesus said the words that we're going to be looking at today. So I want you to turn your Bibles, if you've got them, to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12. The words are going to be up on the screen. There are Bibles also if you want to look at them in front of your uh, chairs there. As John remembers the night as he recorded it, Jesus repeated some of the same things he just said in John 13, starting out with this. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. 
Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. He starts and ends this little passage with the very same words. This is my command, love one another. Must have been important. Why would he repeat himself? Well, Jesus here is obviously at the very end of his life, the end of his ministry. He's looking forward. He's looking back. He's anticipating what's going to be happening with the church, with his disciples. And we have just finished having a bit of a conflict among the disciples about who is going to be the greatest, who is going to be first in the kingdom when Jesus comes into his kingdom. So there's that. And then they've been together for three years, walking the countryside, listening to Jesus. And that's long enough, I think, for them to get to know each other really well and probably to begin to get on each other's nerves a little bit. Uh, You know, they were probably tired of Andrew's snarky wisecracks all the time. And they were probably, Matthew was probably fed up with all the digs he was getting about being a former tax collector. And maybe Simon the Zealot would go on and on about politics all the time, and they had just kind of had it with that. And, of course, Peter. Peter almost said anything imaginable at any given time, and and they often probably laughed behind his back about the next dumb thing he was going to say. Look at how I've loved you, Jesus says. Love each other like that. And it's possible, if you look around this room, given human nature, that there might be some people here in the room that rub you the wrong way. Uh, Maybe even me. Maybe you came through the door this morning and you just were crestfallen. Oh, no. (laughs) Sam's not here. Charlie, that Charlie guy is going to be speaking this morning. I should have gone and played golf. Why doesn't that guy ever cut his hair? It's always getting shaggy. Why does he wear decent clothes? He's got jeans on when he's preaching to the church. He doesn't wear a tie. Why does he sing so loud? Oh, my goodness. And I'll never forget that time when he made a joke that really hurt my feelings. The thing is, this church has, actually God's church has one prerequisite for entry. You have to be a sinner, right? You have to be a sinner. You're all sinners. Some of you are worse sinners than others, but no, 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 that's not true. Not true. Not true. That's not biblical. That is not biblical. We're a big stinking pile of sinners, and that sometimes leads to trouble, which breeds disunity and conflict, right? If we love each other like Jesus loves us, what would that look like? How would we treat each other? Well, so here, something you've heard a bazillion times is what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Yes? There it is. Thanks. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That's pretty easy, right? We do that all the time, right? No, of course not. But that's what Jesus expects of us. He says, love each other with the same generous, selfless love that I have. And love like this, Paul says. Sam said last week that love produces unity. And Jesus wants us to be unified in the church. And so To be united in love brings about the unity that God wants to create among his his family. And it brings honor to his name. Here's another example of Paul writing about love to the Colossians. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. Knit together, that's literally what it says. God in love wants us to become like a garment that's woven together out of separate strands and is united in purpose and in function. He wants us to be entangled by his love like a knit garment. And in that, we're made complete and functional through love. 
So Jesus starts out by commanding us to love each other in this passage we're looking at today. And then in verse 13, he continues and he says this, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one life, one's life for one's friends. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Now, of course, he's referring to himself there. He's heading for the cross. He's about to um, sacrifice himself as the sacrificial lamb for our sin. But if you take this away from Jesus and just think about what does it mean to lay down one's life for one's friends, it means that this love he's talking about is consequential. It's a heavy thing. It's a serious thing. It's not just like a, a quickie uh, Valentine's card you pick up at Walmart for somebody. It's not impulsive. It's active. It's willful. It means serving. It means looking at Jesus' own example and washing each other's feet as an example, either figuratively or sometimes even literally. Jesus, like I say, was foretelling his death, and he's saying that he's about to be nailed to the cross. And he's not calling us to die for each other literally, though that is possible. But he is calling us to serve each other and to lay down our stuff and put others first, I guess would be one way to put it. He's calling us to be ready to make significant sacrifices for each other in the church. The church is not a bowling league where we go out and have a few brews and we swap some stories and we laugh and we joke and then we go away from each other for a week until we come back again and forget about each other. It's not a, a bridge club. It's not a, a little social organization of some kind. Um, it's not like the relationships you have online with TikTok friends. Those relationships evolve around superficial kinds of things like impressing each other or um, just getting something done together like a bowling league and then walking away and not caring what happens. When I think about how to love as Jesus loved me, when I think about laying down my life for you, that says to me that my relationship with you and yours with me needs to be full of genuine caring and deep trust and a commitment, a serious commitment and accountability and openness and fidelity and a willingness to serve you and likewise you serve me. I think the example that's best is the, um, the parable that Jesus gave of the Good Samaritan. And he, in this parable, the Samaritan is a man from Samaria, a part of the, uh, the Jewish world that was in conflict with the Jews and often considered to be enemies of the Jews. And this Samaritan was walking down a road and he saw beside the road a man, a Jew, who had been beaten and was lying bleeding beside the road. And the Samaritan, who normally would have ignored the man, I suppose, or if the situation had been reversed, would have been ignored by the Jew, we can expect, inconveniences himself, goes and bandages the man up, it says, lifts him up and puts him on his donkey, it says, walks with him to a nearby town, serves him, takes him to a hotel, local Motel 6 or something like that, and says, take care of this man, here's some money, and if there's anything else he needs when I come back this way, I will pay it. That is serving each other. That is laying down your life for each other. That's how Jesus describes laying down our lives. From my own life, many of you know that our son died unexpectedly in October, and you guys laid down your lives for us. Uh, it was a terrible time for us. You prayed for us. You sent us cards. You sent us emails. You came to our house and brought us food. You gave us money to cover some of the expenses. You, um, <laughs> One of you even took me down to uh, the impound lot to get my son's car out of impound and then took me out for donuts afterwards. Uh, and, and many of you came together for the memorial service, again, to organize the service, to make this room ready, to get food ready for the people that were going to be there. There were people who provided their homes for us for the out-of-town guests. And most of you didn't even know my son, but you came to the service out of love and support for us, out of care for us, to serve us. And it was a huge thing, still is, in our lives. You were generous, you were kind, you were encouraging and comforting, even if you didn't know what to say. Your presence was a way of serving us. You cared for us. You inconvenienced yourself. You sacrificed, 
and you loved us like Jesus would. And if you look around, there are all sorts of opportunities like that in this family to do the same thing for others who need our support and service and love, who need someone to lay their lives, their lives down for them. So the first point is that to love each other like Jesus did, we lay down our lives in generous and humble service to one another. And then he goes on in verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. There's a word missing there. Everything I have learned from my father, I've made known to you. So now I call you my friends. Amen, Amen is right. So there are two important parts to this. First of all, he says, if you do what I command, you're my friends. And you're my friends because you know my father just exactly as I do. Knowing each other is an important part of being friends. It's, a, it's critical. It's crucial. And it takes time. It's a process. It involves discovery and revelation and building trust. And it takes place kind of mysteriously, right, as we experience life together, as we get to know each other. I love Karchner, Karchner Caverns. I've gone there several times. And if you've ever been there and made the trip, you really should someday if you haven't been there. And, and as you get to Karchner Caverns it's down south of here, uh, you stand outside in the desert, and the desert looks like the desert, you know, rocks and cactus and some trees and, and rough ground. But when you go underground, you find something completely unexpected, beautiful rooms, large caverns, stonework that's been formed over thousands of years, crystal lakes. And friendships are kind of like that too. You know, you begin with a greeting. You say hello to someone, and you exchange names and some trivia about who you are. And maybe that's as far as it ever goes. But sometimes that leads to something much deeper. If you're fortunate, it leads to something much more wonderful. And over the years, it may develop into a relationship that you wouldn't trade for the world. And you couldn't have even imagined at the very start just looking that person in the eye and maybe seeing their name tag on Name Tag Sundays. In verse 15, Jesus tells the disciples that they're no longer servants or students or followers, but his friends. They continue to be his followers, but there's something new happening in their lives. Uh, he says that um, they've gone through a lot together, and they have learned who he is. And they still don't quite get it. They still don't quite understand that he is God himself, but yet... He says, I've revealed everything to you that you need to know about God, and God thinks of you now as his friend. Isn't that remarkable? Jesus is saying that a friendship with God is built around two things, really, two fundamental things. Knowing God, having a relationship with him, and following God, being in obedience to him. We talk about having a personal relationship with God. That's why we talk about having it, because Knowing God is a part of being God's friend. It's, it's a key part. It's a critical part. Jesus himself revealed God to the disciples, and he's also revealed him to us. Through Jesus and the scriptures, prayer, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we get to know God. And on that foundation, we build a friendship with God. And there's another piece, of course, to this friendship. We surrender ourselves to God in obedience. We put conditions on friendship, too. And a true friendship is built on expectations and grace. So if I lend my chainsaw to a friend and he breaks it, there's an expectation that he'll make it good. There's also grace if he doesn't for some reason. If I go out and plan to play golf with a friend and he doesn't show up, well, there's kind of an expectation. He's my friend. He'll, he'll let me know ahead of time that he's not going to be there. But there's grace if he doesn't. And there's grace in our relationship with God and expectations as well. Expectations that we will follow him and obey him and learn from him. But fortunately for us, grace when we fail. God offers his friendship and with the understanding that we come into that relationship confessing that he's God and we're not God. And that friendship 
with God becomes a commitment. Now, what does Jesus even mean by the word friend? Because we use the word a lot, and it means all sorts of different things. Well, the word friend in this particular passage, as John has rendered it, is the word philos. And it means a very um, intimate, special, important friend. But it also has this interesting meaning that it's like used for the, the, the best man in a wedding. And not the best man in the context that we think about it today, not the guy that makes the stag party or whatever it is. Um, but in this case, in Greek and Roman culture, this philos, this best man, would be approached by a friend who would then go to the family of the woman the friend wanted to marry and would say, my friend would like to take your daughter's hand in marriage. Would you be willing to do that? And if they agreed, the philos would then go and make all of the arrangements for the wedding. So he was a very important person in the life, a very trusted person in the life of this friend to go and arrange this, this marriage. That's the kind of friend Jesus is talking about when he talks about us. God thinks of you as your philos, as his philos. The eternal God, the holy God, thinks of you as this intimate friend of his. I even had this thought while I was uh, musing on all of these things. You can imagine God in heaven, in the clouds, sitting around with the angels. They're chilling, and there's not much going on on earth, so they're just talking, you know. And, and God says to the angels, hey, you see Scott over there? Scott is my friend. And, and do you see Sue back there? Sue is my friend. You know, he's kind of dropping names or something like that. I don't know what he's doing. And Ron, he's a really good friend of mine. God thinks of us that intimately, that... The scriptures tell us that we have been adopted into his family. We're sons and daughters. It's another illustration of God's characterizing his relationship with us. He also thinks of us as his friends. And so, the second point is, you are God's friend if you know him and follow him. Love each other like Jesus did. Lay down your life. You're God's friend if you know him and follow him. And then we move on to verse 16 and 17, the end of the passage. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father, the name in the, my name, <laughs> whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. What does that mean? You did not choose me, I chose you. Well, we don't pick our parents, for instance. We don't pick our siblings. We don't get to choose our bosses or the people that we work with. We do get to choose our friends. We do get to choose our spouses, at least in this culture. Jesus obviously chose the 12 disciples. We know those stories. He was walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he pointed out Peter and Andrew and Matthew and invited them all to come and follow him. Did he choose you? Did he choose me? I was 17 when I made my decision to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus. And it was at a point in my life where um, things were hard and bad, and I was desperate. And I wanted to know if God was real and if this Jesus person um, could do anything in my life. And so I was desperate, and I chose to go and find out how to become a Christian. That was true. But it's also possible, isn't it, that at that time in my life, God's Spirit sort of used my desperation and my circumstances to bend my heart towards him. Did God choose me or did I choose God? I'm not going to answer that question today because that's above my pay grade. But here's something I do know. We don't get to choose God's friends for him. In whatever mysterious and wonderful way that God has led us all into a relationship with him and drawn us to church this morning, you and I do not have a say about get, who gets to come through the doors and sit down next to us here in this church. That's God's business. And it's a good thing we don't get to say, have a say in that because if we did, we probably would choose 
people that look a lot like us and think a lot like us and act a lot like us. And that would be at least boring and probably pretty dangerous too. The family God has put together, this Friends of Jesus Society, includes a lot of people who are not like us at all. It may include people who make us uncomfortable. The family of God is made up of people who have accepted God's invitation to friendship, and God hasn't asked our permission for them to be here, has he? We're here, this, this group of sinners who are united by our desire to know and love Christ and by our need for the cross, come from all sorts of different backgrounds, all sorts of different perspectives of life, and yet God has brought us together, hasn't he? He's chosen us all. I heard someone say that the church has more in common with a military unit than a social club, and I think there's some truth to that. We're a very diverse group of people. You can imagine um, boot camp where all these people are thrown into a unit together and are trained together from all sorts of backgrounds, speaking all sorts of languages. We're diverse, but we're all thrown together to fight a battle. And in a battle, you want people who are committed to the mission, people who will follow orders, people who can be counted on to have your back when the fighting is hard. And you want people who can bring out the best in you, don't you? Jesus said that God chose us so that we could bear fruit. The Lord has important work for each of us to do. It says that multiple times in the New Testament. If we're friends, one of the things we'll do is, I think, encourage each other to develop and use the gifts God has equipped us all with. Part of our responsibility as friends is to push our friends a little bit and to encourage them to develop the gifts and do the work that God has for them. The author J.R. Tolkien was very studious, very introverted academic in England. He had an inventive imagination. He wrote wonderful stories, and he was afraid to go public with them. He just kind of wrote them for himself. And in a letter to a friend, he wrote once, I've never had much confidence in my own work, and even now when I'm assured, much to my grateful surprise, that it has value for other people, I feel diffident, reluctant, as if it were to expose my world of imagination to possibly contemptuous eyes and ears. But for the encouragement of C.S. Lewis, I do not think I would ever have completed or offered for publication The Lord of the Rings. Can you imagine that? Such a treasure of literature, The Lord of the Rings. And Lewis, his good friend, encouraged him to take a step out of his comfort zone to share that with other people. God has chosen you and gifted you so that you will bear fruit. That's a given. You will bear fruit because you have the Spirit of God in you. And God has given you friends who see the gifts you have and can encourage you to put them to good use. That's one of the ways friends serve each other. That's one of the ways friends lay down their lives for each other. They encourage each other to take risks, to step out of their comfort zone, and in doing that to bring glory to God. So point three is, we don't pick our friends in the church. God chose all of us so that we could bear fruit, do his work, and learn to love each other. Love each other like Jesus did. Lay down your life in generous and humble service to one another. Look for ways to do that. You are God's friend if you know him and follow him. Maybe you've been beat up by life. Maybe you don't feel like God loves you. God loves you and calls you his friend. We don't pick our friends in the church. God chose all of us so that we could bear fruit, do his work, and learn to love one another. And I'll close with a final thought. We're a big enough church here that we really have a hard time getting to know everyone and getting to know each other well, which means that, you know, we tend to stick to the same seats every Sunday, and we tend to stick with the same people every Sunday, and we don't often kind of wander too far out of our own comfort zones of the people we know, and I'm guilty of this myself. Um, every week, new people come into the church try to decide if this is a place they'd like to attend. Sometimes they sit by themselves, and no one offers to sit with them or offers to have them sit with them. And every week there are people on the other side of the room that you see and you recognize, but you may never have learned their names or you may never have taken the opportunity to try to get to know them. Maybe we can change that. Maybe we can move seats some Sunday 
and impose ourselves on some of the people in the, in the really special seats or something. Get to know others. Open yourself up to the possibility of friendship with each other. How can we lay down our lives for each other if we don't know each other? What if we become more intentional about meeting new people and introducing them to our own friends and to ourselves? Would grace become known for its love? If you want to think more about this idea of friendship and faith, this book, No Greater Love, is excellent by Rebecca McLaughlin. Uh, she's written a number of books that I love, and it covers the whole gamut of what does Jesus really mean when he says, no greater love has a friend than that he, uh, anyone, that he lays down his life for his friends. I recommend it. Just like Andy in the movie Toy Story, Jesus loves you in a way that you've never experienced before. Jesus has even written his name on you, like Andy did on Woody's boot. And Jesus calls you his friend. It's a life-changing gift. Embrace it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are, hard to say, we are your friends. You think of us as your friends because of the work of the cross of Jesus Christ, your son. It would not be possible otherwise. We know we disappoint you. We know we fail you. We know we let you down. And yet, because of grace, you come back to us time after time and you say, hey, friend, let's get this, let's make this right. Around the world, there are people worshiping you today who speak other languages, who come from such radically different backgrounds. In this community, there are people who don't share many of the things we have, people who are of a completely different economic circumstances, have political views that we don't agree with, have a background that may make us uncomfortable. And yet in Christ, you have said they are our friends because they're your friends. Open our hearts, Father. Open our hearts to be a welcoming church, a church that is really ready to dive into serving one another and laying down our lives for each other. Show us how to do that. Father, we love you and we thank you for your grace to us. And we thank you for pulling us into your world, letting us know you and for your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.
be seated. We're going to enter into communion commune this morning. Um, communion is open in the Covenant Church to anyone who has declared their faith in Jesus Christ. There are communion cups on the back there if you haven't gotten one for yourself yet. Before we do that, let's take a moment of silent prayer. Just to, I'm asking you to talk to God quietly in your own heart about whatever is on your heart to prepare yourself for communion. Let's pray. We thank you for hearing our prayers, Father. On that same night that we've been talking about, Jesus and the disciples were gathered around the table, and Jesus took a loaf of bread and prayed over it, blessed it, and then he broke it into pieces, and he passed the pieces around the table to the other disciples. And he said to them, this is my body, which is being broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. You may eat this bread. They undoubtedly didn't know what he was talking about, but they did so. And then he took a cup and filled it with wine and lifted it up and blessed it and said, this wine is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is being shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Let's drink of the cup. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbly laying ourselves before you and thanking you this morning for your great grace, your great grace which is beyond our understanding, <laughs> certainly beyond, well beyond anything we deserve, and yet given freely to us in the blood and the, and the bread in the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for 
being willing to call us friends and for laying down your life for us. We pray that you will never let us forget as we go through the days of our lives the debt we owe you and the completeness of the forgiveness that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. to say a special thank you to the worship team. They do such a terrific job of using their gifts and to Jeanette who every week spends a lot of time praying about the music as, and, and how to f make it work well with the message, the themes that we're talking about today. And I want to say a special thanks to Ron, our drummer, who uh, <laughs> drives down every week from South Dakota just to drum for us. Thank you, Ron. Not really, not really. Uh, I want to remind you that there is prayer over here. Gloria will pray for you if you have any needs at all. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Choking on the communion wafer. <clears throat> and, um, and also, if you have a prayer concern that you don't want to take the time to talk to Gloria about, you can write it down on the uh, little card in front of you. Put it in the back. Women's Retreat is coming up. Today's the last day to sign up. If you are a woman of the church and you would like to make some more friends with the women of the church, perfect opportunity to do that. 
So sign up today. And there's a picnic, I think. A picnic today? Is that right? Yeah. Two o'clock. And actually, it's a kind of come whenever kind of thing. It's ending at 5, 2 o'clock down at it's the Lambert Park, is it? All right. There'll be a kiosk there. Riverfront. Riverfront. That's what it's called. Right. Um, you can come later if you want, but the desserts may be gone. We normally eat those first. But there'll be plenty of stuff. If you haven't signed up, there's plenty of food. Just come. It'll be a great to get, opportunity to get to know others. And let's close with this benediction from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12. <clears throat> Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.